Okay, then. So we've spoken at great length about the Omer as a matir for Achilas Chadosh. Now we're going to talk about the Isak Tzira. And you're not allowed to cut from the five species of grains from the new crop before the Omer is brought, because the Torah says in Emor, of course, Reishis Ktsirchen, that the first harvest, the first grain that you harvest is the one that's brought as the omer. So if you cut grains before the omer is cut, then you're undermining the status of the omer as Reishis Ktsirchen. Now in this case, we're not dealing with a lav, a violation of a lotas, as we were with regard to lotoflu, like the Torah says, with regard to chadosh, you're not allowed to eat chadosh. Here the Torah doesn't say you're not allowed to cut the new crop. It just says that you have to bring the first cutting as the omer. So what you're doing now is what I would call maybe bitl essen, meaning you're undermining the kiyum of, of reishis ktsirchem. Now here we have a machlokes achron. This is going to be a machlokes between the Shagas Arye and the Orsamet. Vuashish Risha, we achar ktsir sa omer. What happens and what's the status of tfua that was planted and took root after the omer was cut already? So he, he, he hasn't yet been makr of the Omer. He's already cut the Omer. So they did Ktsira, but not Hakrava. And in that window between Ktsira and Hakrava, the Tvua reached Shlish. And the question is, is he allowed to cut it down? Intuitively, we'd say, yes, he can cut it down because he's already cut down the Omer. So the Omer is al already racist Ktsira and that's the opinion of Rabbeir Simcha Mitvinsk in the Arsameh. You're not undermining the status of the Omer as Reishis Ketzirchem because you've already cut down the Omer. You want to cut down something else that's fine. But the Shagatzai was of the opinion that you need both Ketzira and Akrova. It's like a package deal. And only afterwards can you cut down some other ktsir that's not going to be racist ktsir, so it won't be the omer. Now, I'm just going to read to you the words of the Shagas Arya. He writes, Dafka ktsira sa omer, matira es ktsira sa chodosh. Afa kravoso matira es ktsira sa chodosh. So I think I, I just want to switch around what we call mukhlefes hashitos. It's the Arsameh who, who requires Hakro, <clears throat> whereas the Shagasari says it's enough that you do the Ketzir. No, nothing changes the names. Ain loken al Ketzir as HaKadosh Kodem HaOmer Gnesha Ein Bo Iser Lav Ela Lav HaBo Mechal Esse Bilvad. Okay, I called it a Bittal Esse, and he calls it a Lav HaBo Mechal Esse. Bidi Evel Atfua HaKetzura Muteris. Right? There's no Iser Cheft over here. It's only an Iser Gav. You, you usurped the status of the Omer as Reish's Ketzir. But that which you cut is not a Cheft of the Isura. Now, are you allowed to cut Chadash in Chutzlars before the Omer was cut? Here we have a Machlokas again. In this case, he quotes the Rambam, and the Rambam is of the opinion in Hilfus to be the Musafin that Isur Ktsiras Chodesh Kon Omer ain't an Oge Elaberet Sisra. And this is intuitively logical because if there's a competition between two Ktsiros, then you have to allow the Ketzir Omer to be the first Ketzir if you go ahead and jump the gun. But that's because there's a competition. Each one of these two Ketzirahs could be the Omer. But in Chutzlaret, 
where you cannot bring that Ksira as an Omer, then it's not like you can compare the two Ksiros and say, well, why did you jump the gun and cut this Ksira before the Ksira of the Omer? It's not even a, it's not even a candidate. It doesn't have the potential of being the Omer. That is the Shitas Haram. However, in Menachos, we have a Shita Mekubetes. And the Shita Mekubetes, although I think he agrees with the logic of the Rambam, but he says the following. There is a machlokas between Rabbi Yossi, Rabbi Yehuda, and the Chacham. The Chacham of Shit is that you can't bring the Omer from Chutzlars. And based on that Shit, the Ramam's conclusion is absolutely, is absolutely correct. That there's no Isar of Ketzira on Ketzir Chutzlars because it's not Roy for the Omen. However, Rabbi Yossi, Rabbi Yehuda, in Menachas Tafpei Dalit, is of the opinion that the Omer is ba afni chutzas. We can import wheat that's racist ktsirchem from chutzlaretz, and we can use it and dedicate it for the Omer. According to Rabbi Yossi, Rabbi Yehuda, we should really prohibit cutting the Omer even in chutzas, because even the grains of chutzlaretz are candidates for the mitzvah of the omen. And that is the opinion of the Shita Mekubetzis. However, the Shita Mekubetzis quotes another opinion, right? The Shita Mekubetzis is an anthology of, of Rishonim, so he quotes another dissenting opinion that I feel the Shitas from Yosef Bermuda, who holds that you could bring the omen from chutzlaretz, there's no Isa Ktsira on Tvuas Chutzlars. She can Isa Zer, who me mitzvos ha Tvuyos Ba'aretz, the Eina no Heges Ela Ba'aretz. This is very paradoxical. He's saying that on the one hand, the Omer itself, which we would have thought is the archetypical, you know, paradigm of Mitzvah Tli Ba'aretz, is not a Mitzvah Tli Ba'aretz at all. You can bring it from Chutzlars. But the Isa Ktsira is a mitzvah tliya ba'aretz. It only applies to Tuas Eretz Yisrael. That is the second opinion in the Shita Mubetzis. And he writes in the note, I feel the Shita Shehuvu El, the Isra Achilas Chodosh, Noe, Minat Torah Ach B'chutzlar, it's Einzeh, so we don't have this extra yalfusa, this extra as a ribui to include ktsira. That only includes the Isra Achilas Chadash. But the Pele here, which I don't understand, is a coin to Rabbi Yossi, Rabbi Yehuda, that the Omer is is ba mituas chutzlars. So the Omer itself is a classic case of a mitzvah to mivaret. I'm sorry. I meant to say is that the Omer is a classic case of a mitzvah she'enot to mivaret. Right? You can bring the Omer from tuas chutzlars according to Yosi. But now you went ahead and you cut down. A ktsir of chita, let's say, minachadash, before you brought the, before you cut the omen. No, that's only a mitzvah to your bars. Oh, I hear. You. He's saying like this, when you go out to cut the harvest from the new crop in the land of Israel, then you cannot cut any new crop before you've cut the omen. But that's a mitzvah to of arts. That's a halacha in k'tziras t'huas eretz Yisrael. 
There's no such halach in Tzuras Chutzah. Again, the Omer itself could be brought from Chutzah. But the Isa Ktsira means don't preempt the Omer in Eretz Yisrael. So we're looking at the Ktsir of Eretz Yisrael, the whole process of harvesting grains in Eretz Yisrael. We're saying that comes the time for the first Ktsir, you've got to cut down the Omer. Now you have another question, a separate independent issue. Where does the Omer itself come? So that if you cut the Omer in Chutzlar, that's fine, according to Rabbi Yossi, and you'll bring it here to Israel and bring it on the Mizbeach as Karbana Omer. Once you've done so, then you can cut any other Ktsir Chadash, you can do a Ktsir Chadash anywhere in Eretz Yisrael. But there, were never, there was never an Easter in Chutzlar. So, you know, we're not going to send out you know, some sort of a, a cruise, you know, a message to you know, the Jews in on the Antarctica that, okay, now you can cut your, your you know, the new the new crop because we've already brought the old. There's no such halacha. In Eretz Yisrael, there's halacha that the first ketzir has to be the ketzir. That's the second opinion in the Sheet of Mugumot. Okay. Now, we want to know what's the status of a field that's irrigated. It cannot persist, uh, it cannot subsist on rainwater alone. And that's called a base hashalfa. Hashalfa means that we take water from elsewhere in order to irrigate the field. Well, the Gemara, the Gemara presents a stira of two psukim. And we'll see how the Gemara is able to reconcile this theory. What, what is this theory? What Hossack says, Uktsartem es ktsira vavesem es ha'om. says two things. You should cut down your, your crop, harvest your crop, and then bring the oak. There doesn't seem to be any indication in that possible. That it's also you can't cut down your ktsir before the omer. On the contrary, it says ktsartem is a ktsira, and then vavesim is omer. But another pasuk says reishis ktsirachem that the omer has to be the first of your harvest. So how do we reconcile this apparent contradiction? The Gemara says our ketzar mimakom shatamevi omer iata kotze mimakom she iata mevi omer ata kotze. If this grain is a potential candidate for the Omer, then you're not allowed to cut it down until they cut down the Omer. If it's not a potential candidate for Omer, then you're allowed to cut it down. But when the Pasuk says, it's referring to a Ktsir of Beis HaShal, where it cannot be a candidate for the Omer, so therefore you're allowed to cut it down even before the Omer was cut down. When the Pesach says, Reishis Ketzirchem, it's Reishis Ketzirchem from that Ketzir that could be valid for the Omer. And therefore, Lo Hitiru El Beis HaShalchem, Beis HaShalchem means it's arid land, Behi Sadi Yavesha, and in the case of Beis HaShalchem, which requires irrigation, if we're going to say, you know what? No harvest. We haven't yet brought the Omer. We haven't cut down the Omer. Then any Tua that's growing in this arid, dry land is going to wither away. And we're going to have to take a loss by delaying the Ketzira of a Beis Hashal. I will be Sharmakomos anywhere else. No loss if you delay the harvest until they harvested the Omer. Ain't hefsed the Iku of Haksira. And therefore, Loitiru, they would not permit Afilu She'en Mevimeh Mesa Omer. Even if in that particular Katsu, they would not bring it for the Omer. So again, we don't bring the Omer from Pesach Shalchim, but yet, you will allow 
One second. Let me just get the just get the math. They tried to mute, but it didn't work. I don't know why. Maybe you have to do the mute before you start the cheer and you can't do it during the I don't know what the technology of Zoom is. But anyway, getting back to this. So again, we cannot bring the Omer from Beis HaShalch in an irrigated field. And that's explicit in the Mishnah in Mesech de Menachos. Because apparently the Tvua that grows in an irrigated field is not the top quality so because of that difference in the quality, we excluded from this carbon mincha called mincha sa'om. Okay. Now we want to know, are you allowed to cut down vua mimokom she'iyata mevi omen? And we have a, a steer into psukim, and we're not going to go over it again, but the Pasuk says, u'ktsartem is k'tsira. And we're going to say that that's me mokom she'iyata o iyata mevi ha'omer at the If that be the case, then you can cut down the tvua of a beis ha'shalchim. But yet, what we're saying is that, and this is apparently Rashi in his first interpretation, that we're only going to allow you to cut down the tvua of the beis ha'shalchim before we we cut down the omer because of the financial loss that you'll suffer if you wait too long to delay the tzira. Because in a dry, arid land, you've got to do the tzira as early as possible. If you wait and delay, it's just going to dry up. It's worthless. And again, we're trying to mute... In any event, the law is the following. They were matir beis ha-shalchim, and for the reason that we gave. There are other places where they could delay, easily delay the ketzira, and no loss, without suffering any loss. None of the two is going to dry up and wither away. And nevertheless, even though you cannot bring the omer from that tvua, you're still not allowed to cut it down until after they cut the omer. Yesha Kasuv. Now we're going to take up the Minchas Kiddush. Until now, this was the way Rashi interpreted the sugya in his first interpretation. And Minchas Kiddush says, Kol Makom Shein Mevi'a Mehem. If you cannot bring the omen from those areas, I don't need this overriding, uh, compelling reason of, of hefse that you'll suffer a loss if you delay the ketzira. Even if you suffer no loss, you're allowed to do an early ketzira from Makomos, She'em Mevi'a Mehem Ha'om. That's a simple shot in the reconciliation of the two psukim that we saw before. Now, getting back to the cheat of the Bet says, Dafka base has shalfim with the Vixir, which will never reach the Xir of El Gabi Tua Shekzi Rosa Bisman Echa. I will base has shalfim aim bishulo shom. When you irrigate a field, then the, the grains will develop and mature over the course of time. There's no uniform moment of ketzira. And the lava bomachal essay that we derive from Rashi's ketzira only applies to ketzira mizman echa, when the tefua could all be cut down at one time. And it's really interesting. Yeah, I don't know what to do. Can you think of, a, of an etzah here? I don't, I'll try it again. Try it again. But not working for me. He has, to, he has to mute it himself. I know, I but unfortunately, whatever, you know. With, I hear it also. He's, I think he's having problems with it. I see it keeps going on and off. Oh, I see. Yeah. All right. We'll, we'll try to do the best we can. 
and hopefully you'll be able to hear me. Maybe the Hamaim. Oh, Chaim. Chaim. No, he's not. He's Chaim. Hello. Chaim, ¿qué pasa, señor? Colbesader. <laughs> okay, muchas gracias. Muy bien. Can you do me a favor, Chaim, and mute your microphone? Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. That would Sorry, really yeah. allow me to say the cheer because. Right. We got it. Again, we have two understandings of Beis HaShalchan and why we're allowing Ketzira early in the case of Beis HaShalchan before we did the Ketzira Sa'omer. One approach is that it's because of the Hefzeh. We don't want to have a person suffer a loss by delaying the Ketzira. But if that be the case, then it's quite possible that there are other locations where we could delay the Ketzira. And even if those locations are not potential candidates for the Omer, it still would be awesome. We have another approach that, the, that in the case of Beis HaShach, you're allowed to cut down the Vua early before the Ketzira Sa Omer for a different reason. And that's because Ains Man Ketzira So Shava. Then in the case of an irrigated field, the development of the grains is, is going to be in a delay reaction. You know, there'll be some grains that'll be developed on this day. For some days, we have to wait another day till they mature, until we can say they're ripe enough for harvest. And in such a case, we're allowed to cut down the kvua, even though we have not yet cut down the om. And he adds another footnote here. He says, Lef'amim the Otsa Sada, in one field itself, you could have some Tvua that develops before the other Tvua on different sides of the field, because again, you know, there's no rain that that uh, irrig that uh, waters the field uniformly. There's irrigation, and some parts will get the water before other parts. Now, but Mako Chibuta Liksar Kodama Omer, even though we're going to allow you to cut down prematurely in the case of a Beis HaShalchan, for example, and possibly other cases. But nevertheless, nevertheless, Lasso's Gaddish also. Gaddish means that the next stage in the process after you Cut down the the tvua, that means harvesting, is called imur, ayin yud mem vav uh, which is otherwise known as gadish. Gadish means haystacks. You know, you stack the two together. We're not going to allow you to do gadish. We're afraid. That if we allow you not only to harvest the grains before the Omer, but also to pack them up into stalks, into, um, not stalks, what is the word I'm looking for, into piles or stacks and so forth, then you might come to eat it and it's chadash because they haven't brought the Omer yet. We're only going to allow you a limited head there and that's harvesting, but not to put it into these piles to this gudge. Now, here's another case of cutting down Tvua before the Omer. Number one, we spoke before about Hefzeh. So, Kodem Ktsira Sa Omer, Mutar Liktsar Bein Hanatios Kideshalo Yafs Yifsidu. Apparently, what you uh, these are agricultural rules. You plant two main plantings, and then you have smaller plants in the middle. And those smaller plants, once they mature, they start draining the nutrients from the ground. And as a result, your mainstay 
uh, plantings will, will, will get destroyed. So once again, there's a hefset issue here. And since we're only dealing with an essay, we can be makil and allow you to cut down that vua bain hanetios. The netios are the main plantings. They shall yafsidu. And you have to add another principle here, another condition here, that this vua that grows between the netios is, is not a high quality vua. You know, you don't want to waste all that space in your ground. Ground is important. But it's lower quality grains and we would never bring the owner from such grains. Add to that, that if we don't cut down these grains, you're going to have a hefse. So when you add A plus B, then you end up with a heter leniency that you're allowed to cut down these grains between the nitios. And Rashi adds another point over here. There's another reason why we're going to allow you to cut all those grains that are between the teos. So now Rashi is addressing a case of the teos like a vineyard. Imagine that you grow um, grains in between two vines. And we're worried about kilayim. Because as the grains and the vines develop, if they're in close proximity, then there'll be a mixture which is called klaya keret, which is called kilant. We're going to allow you to cut down that tvua that's between the nitios in order to circumvent and prevent you from violating kilant. Kigon, Shabishosh and Nizra. When he planted his, his wheat, he had not yet planted his vine. Then he planted his nitios. Here's another case where they allowed you to cut down Tvua before the Omer. And that is kidei lefanos mokum laveum lasheves berachva shall ear ulevarech berkas rechava. There were certain locations that were designated, earmarked for the avelim. That right after the burial took place, the avelim would sit in a public area or an area that was accessible to the public. The public would come by, and they would be menachem. They would console the avel. And then they would recite a, we don't have it today, but they would recite a special bracha called bracha birchas rechava. Rechava is the open marketplace, so to speak. Uh, the square, if you will, the open square in the city. And that's where the people would gravitate in order to console the, the bereaved. And there was a special bracha that was recited there. Now, if that area is crowded with, with grains that are growing, which makes it uncomfortable to bring the masses of people from the city to be Makayim, their obligation vis-a-vis the Ovel, and be Makayim, Mitzvah, Abelim, Nicham, Abelim, then they loud cutting down the Tvua in the middle of this Rechavah ear before the Ktsira of the Omen. And why is that? Because it's a ktsir mitzvah. We're not just cutting down and harvesting that which we want for ourselves as a rishos or market it and so forth, but we're doing it and we're compelled to do it because of a mitzvah. Like before we had the case of kilayim, we want to avoid a violation of the Easter kilayim. Now it seems that some of these outdoor areas were used for Talmidim, for students, when it was crowded inside the base Medrash and the, the spillover, you know, they would go out and sit and the Rebbe, Roshiva would come and teach them outdoors. Muta Liktar, it made base HaMedrash, Kidei Lefanos Mokom Yeshiva Sa Talmidim. If we don't have enough room for the students to sit, we're going to pre permit 
cutting down the tefua of the new crop before cutting the omen. She came nema reishis k'tzirachem. Hainu k'tziras reshutz. Ava k'tziras mitzvah lo nesu. There was never prohibition of a k'tziras mitzvah. The afsha hutru k'tziras elu ain likroch es ha-tfua lealumos. Once again, they only allowed you to cut it down to be mafana boko, right? To vacate the area that we can put more chairs there for the two students. But to put them into our lumos, into sheaves, that they wouldn't allow, but rather they should leave it in a state of almost a natural state after you cut it down without even tying it together in bundles so that we shouldn't lead to possibly eating and violating the Easter the Easter. This is where this is where we'll stop. And Amir Tzashem will pick it up up to now. We both say we're here on Daf Pei Ches Amid Aleph in the middle of the Omud. And we're up to the next to the last of the skinny lines. And you'll see that the line starts with the, with, uh, actually it's three lines up before you get to the line lines. It starts with the word Mehemmet. Now we're looking for, as you recall, from Yom Hamishi, a source for the reliability of one witness, because we proved from a diuk in the ratio of the safer back and forth, that if a married woman, in a case where her husband went far away on a trip and now one witness testifies that he knows that he died and she's allowed to get a heter, she can get a license from the Besdin to get remarried. So how do we know that we can believe the testimony, rely on the testimony of one witness. We're looking for a source. We tried to bring a proof from the case of one witness who says to Ruben, you ate chalet, and therefore you have to bring a carbon chatos. But we came to the conclusion that that would not be an adequate proof because there, the fact that the that Ruven did not contradict the witness, that itself is called Hoda. And basically he's admitting that yes, in fact, I did eat Chelet. Then we had another uh, opportunity to prove it from a case when you have something that's unidentified. You don't know if it's Chelev or if it's Shuman. If we know it's Chelev, then all the witnesses in the world who would testify that Shuman are not believed. But if we don't know the identity of this fact, you know, we don't know if it's Shuman or if it's Chelev, then one aid is believed. So the Gemara says that's not a good proof at all. Because yes, we rely on one aid to clarify a suffix. But what happens when the aid is coming to undermine what's called a cheskas iser. We have reason to believe that it's oser. And now the aid is testifying that the iser was removed. And in such a case, we would, like in the case of our mission where we have a married woman and you need testimony to remove ha cheskas iser, ha cheskas eishas ish, we don't have any proof that an Eid Echad, one witness, would in fact be believed to change our status quo and contradict our cheskas eishas ish. So where do we have a proof, a source, for the nemonus, the trustability or, or reliability of the testimony of one witness, one single witness against a chazok, against the cheskas is to be matir a cheskas is. 
Are you, are you, are you following? So Gemara says, Midi the Havi Atevel Hegdesh Vikonomis. We have three categories here of Isu. And there's a certain great similarity between all of them. Evel means that he cut down his wheat or his grains, and he hasn't yet taken off Trumot's umasros. And until he do, does so, it's also be isu tevel, it's a chiyuv misa videi shamayim. Then we have hegdesh. If a person enjoys the benefit of hegdesh, unless there was pigeon, if it hasn't been redeemed, then he's in violation of an Isa Me'ila. And then we have the case of Konomos. Konomos is a case of a person who took a neder and he said, this is Konom Alai, Konom Kikar Zelai. He looks at a loaf of bread, for example, and he calls it a Konom. Alai, on me. To me, it should be a Konom. The word Konom is a corruption of the word carbon. Apparently, back in Babel in Aramaic, instead of using the word carbon, they would use it, use the word konam. And if a person takes a neder with the word konam, he's basically calling it a carbon. And there's a one opinion in the Gemara, we'll soon see it, holds Yesh Me'ila the Konomos. That basically, his nether is like a nidre hegdesh. He's engendering a status of hegdesh into this kikar of lecha. Now an aide comes along, a witness, and he testifies that what you thought was tevel or hegdesh or konomos and therefore was asur is actually mutter. Now, what does the aide Testify, what does he know? So the Gemara is going to go through various scenarios to see in what cases we believe the aid and why do we believe the aid. Now, again, we have to be sensitive by way of introduction to this sugya, to the following. The issue of relying on an aide to testify about a husband that he died to allow his wife to get married is a twofold is issue. One issue is, can we believe an aide echad, one witness, against the chazaka, cheskes isu? There's another issue, which is called Ein Dover Shebe'erva Pachos Mishnayim. And you'll see that about 12 lines down from the top of our Omud Peiches, that the Torah says, Al Shnayim, Al Pishnayim, Eidim Yokum Dover. And Dover, Dover Mi Momon, we learn that just like in Momon it says Dover, and in Erva it says, Ish Ki Yim Tzuba Erva is Dover. So we have Xer Shove Dover Dover from which we derive that just like in Momon, in monetary disputes, we require as evidence two witnesses. One witness simply won't do. So too in the other Dover, which is a Dover Sheba Erva, in Motzaba Erva's Dover, we need two witnesses. So even if you'll convince me, even if you'll prove to me from some source that Eid Echon is believed against the Chazok, for example, in the case of Tevel, we're going to believe one aid to say that you're allowed to eat this tour, but still we're not dealing with the Dover Sheba Arab. So I just want to point out to you that this Gemara is not yet addressing the issue of Dover Sheba Arab. That's going to come down the line, but not now. Right now, the Gemara is only trying to address one issue. Can we believe a witness against the Cheskes Isa? The Gemara says, Hi, Tevel, Hechi, Dom. Okay, now, 
in order to, again, I, I need one more introduction. I hope you'll bear with me. There are two categories of Nehmanus in Isurim. One is Eid Echad, and the other is Biyada, Bet Yud Dalit Vav. And the Torah believes a person to say about themselves what they could have done. Now, if I say I did what I could have done, I'm believed because I could do it. But if I testify on your behalf, I can't do what you could do. You're the Bailim, I'm not the Bailim. Then my testimony is not, again, it's not reliable under the concept, under the category of Biyadah. I might be believed as an Eid or maybe I'm not going to be believed as an Eid because I'm smashing up against the Cheskas Isur. But Cheskas Isur is irrelevant in a case of Biyada. So, for example, if a woman who was the Cheskas Nida, she testifies that she counted Zayin Akim, she went to the mikvah, she's believed not because of Eid Echad and Bisuri, not because one Eid is reliable, but because of biyada, or for example, a shochet who says that this meat is muta because I shechted it, he's believed because he has the ability to shecht it. So whenever I'm testifying about my own actions, I'm believed. Let's say on Erev Pesach, I would rent you a house and I would tell you that it's baduk, it's been checked for chametz. You could rely on my testimony even though every, every house has a cheskas eno baduk, meaning a cheskas chametz, you can rely on my testimony because the other, because I have the ability to check my own house. So now in the case of Tevel, if somebody testifies that there was a hafrasha of Chumas of Maestras and it's no longer Tevel, if he's testifying about his own tvua, then it's biyadam, because he has the ability to be mafres, shumas, and maestros. So the Gemara says, Hai tevel What's the case? If he's testifying on his own teva, that he was mafres, shumas, and maestros, that has nothing to do with Eidech and then Bisur. Be shun to be other lesakni. The Torah vests trustability, like uh, you know, uh, reliability on anything that you're testifying that's biyado. You're basically saying, "I did what I could have done." So if it's my personal tour that we're dealing with, and I testify that I know the truths of Isa were taken off, I'm believed because of biyado. We have no choice but to assume that a person is believed to tell Yenom that your Tvua is not Teva, that the Truma was taken away from your Tvua. Here there's no Nehmanus of the other because I can't be Marfish Truma Meiser from your Tvua. I can only be Marfish from my own Tvua. And thereby, by the process of elimination, the only way we could justify that we believe Ruvain to tell Shimon that Shimon's Tvua was already Mufrash, I mean, the Truma Samaisa were taken off, that's called Tikkun, is only if you assume that Eid Echad is Nehmon. He can't be believed under the Allah of Biyad, he doesn't have Biyad. And now we can prove that it Echad is believed against the Cheskas Isa. Because right now, status quo, what we know about this Tvu is that it's Tevel. At one point for sure, it was Tevel. Comes along Shimon and he says about Ruvain's Tvu that it's not Tevel. And the Trumas of Isis were already been removed. He is testifying against the Cheskas Isa. El So the Gemara says, wait a minute, you know what? There is a logical possibility that Shimon could be mafrish 
Tumas of Meisters from Ruvain's uh, uh, grains. Because in effect, Shimon is doing Ruvain a favor instead of Shimon have, having to you know, have this headache on his head that he's got to be mouth for Shumas and Meisters. Instead of Ruvain having, you know, all that. So Shimon came along, you know, Zachary Olam Shalbufarov, and he did him a, you know, a good Samaritan action. He was mouth for Shumas and Meisters on behalf of Ruvain. And it's valid. So the Gemara says, my Kasover, point to that opinion, I Torem Mishalal Shachavero, I can do a freshest truma on your behalf. And that's called Eno Tsarech Das Bailu. I don't have to notify Ruven if I'm going to be Mafra's Truma on his behalf. Now, wait a second. <laughs> what do you mean you're being Mafra's Truma on his behalf? Are you taking his tour and designating for the coin without his knowledge? That's not Zachary the other Shalom Fana. I mean, the coin is very happy about it, but I can't take your tour and designated for the Kohen. That, that's not Zohar the other Shalom. But the Gemara is talking about a case now, it's what I call a good Samaritan, where Shimon takes his own produce and designates it as Shumas and Meisers on behalf of Ruvain's grains. For Ruvain, this is a win win situation. He doesn't have to take any loss and give to the Kohen or the Levi because Shimon took out of his pocket. So certainly in such a case, Shimon would be operating on behalf of Ruvain for the interest of Ruvain, even Shalom Midas Bailin, even if Shimon hasn't notified Ruvain, it should be absolutely valid. And that is one opinion. If I'm taking Mishalo, meaning from my tour, and being mafresh for, to, for, on your Tamil, for your Tamil to make it into Chulin, I don't need to notify you, according to this opinion. Is now in a case where Shimon comes to testify that he knows that true and Mises were taken from Ruvain's tour, now we could believe Shimon based on that look of Biyadam, because Shimon could have been Mafra's Truma on behalf of Ruvain. If on the other hand, Iko Sobar Tzarek Das Bail, you can't just go ahead and be Mafra's Truma for the sake of, uh, of Ruvain without notifying him. That doesn't operate. Is then Tzorach Das Bailin? Is Vyomar Ano Yadana Beta Misaket? I know for sure, I'm testifying, this is Shema, that there was Truma and Maisu taking out of Ruvain's Tvur. And now we're holding that Eino Adam Torim Al Shalom Chavero without Das Bailin. He can't do it. So there's no Vyodo of it. The only reliability that he has is Vitorah Seid Echon. And not only that, he's going against the Cheskes Isa. We have a perfect source to prove that an Echad is believed even against the uh, Cheskes Isa. And if we swing back to the Ashes Ish case in our Mishnah, he's testifying one aid that he knows that her husband died. And he should be believed. Again, we're not talking about the issue of Ein Dover Shem Erebox Mishnah. We can do undergo the same analysis with regard to Hegish. He could do just domin. Okay, now there are two categories of Hegish. And this we know, this is like the ABC of Hegish. It's Kiduchas domin and Kiduchas Aguf. So Kiduchas domin means that I consecrate the value of an object. Kedusha Saguf means the object itself becomes inherently Hegdish. Kedusha Saguf. For example, if I look at an animal and I say, it's my animal, Arezu Ola, 
That's Kedusha Saguf. If on the other hand, let's say I take this table of mine, assuming it was mine, and I say I raise a hegdesh, that's called Kedusha Saguf. Which means that the Gizbar has a right representing hegdesh to haul away my chair or my table. Alternatively, I have the right to be poder the table. That's because Kedushas Domin is exactly what it says. Domin, its value is Hegdish. Intrinsically, the object is not Hegdish. I am only being Magdish, its value, its market value. So, E Kedushas Domin, if you're going to talk about a person who's testifying about Kedushas Domin, and he's saying that I know that I know for sure that they were put in this hegdish. He's believed to testify that there was a pigeon. And why is that? Because it's beyond him. He himself could have been poted. And I believe, I'm looking to see if I can prove this to you. Yes. If you take a look at footnote number 23, he says anyone can redeem Hegdish, an item that possesses monetary sanctity. So now, again, we're back to square one. We have the other. Because he himself, the witness, could have been Poden and Hegdish, because anyone could be Poden and could just done it. He could do just a goof. What's the only... Now, how can we be matir kedusha saguf? So, for that, we need tos. Now, I'm not 100 cor percent correct in my, you know, precise, but just to convey the message, tos means that anything that, any time that I speak. And I generate an Easter, I can always null and void that Easter. I go in front of a tribunal of three people and I say to them, you know what, I made a mistake. This was not what I bargained for. My circumstances have changed. I want an annulment of this Haflas pair, which is a neder or a shvua, or, or a nedava, or kedush saguf, all the above. There's no such thing as pidyon in kedush saguf, assuming it's a tam, not a balmum. Pidyon is not an option. But he could claim that he made a big mistake when he was Magdish. He didn't realize the repercussions, you know, how much it's gonna cost him. So he goes in front of a tribunal and then Matim. So the Gemara says, E.D. Day, if this witness is testifying about Kedusha Saguf, be sure to be Yodolit Shulei Ale. He has the power to go in front of a tribunal or in front of a what's called a chacham yachid mumche, an expert chacham, and he could be shoel on the hegdish. He could actually null, annul the original hegdish. A month ago, I took a, a vow that this is hegdish. A month later, I could nullify that vow. this is becoming a little cumbersome to me. Give me a minute, I'm going to have to get another stender.
feel like you get away with uh, you waste the time, but it's not, it's not happening. Okay. So you still with me? All right. So now again, we're back to square one. We have another case of Biodo because I own this Hegnish. This is my Elsie the cow. I was Magdish, this cow as an Ola, as a Shlomim, whatever it was. And now it's Biyadi to go ahead and stand in front of a tribunal or in front of a Yachin Mubche, and I could annul and void that Hegnish. So that's again another example of the young. Ella says the Gemara di Acher. Shimon is testifying about Ruvain's animal, which is Hegdei, that I know that uh, there was an annulment of the Hegdei, and therefore it's Mutter, it's Chulun. And the Gemara says, that that would be a case where he contradicts a cheskas isur because we have every reason to believe that this is hegdesh. We know that the Bible would magdish it, lim is bear. And now he's saying that there was an asha'ela, there was an annulment. So he's undermining a cheskas isur. And if he's believed, then we see clearly that. Eight effort is never even against the Cheskasis. But, but I apologize, I skipped three words in the Gemara, which now appear for the second time. That's why I reminded myself that I skipped it. And that's he Gufa Minola. So going back to the original case that we discussed earlier of Tevel, where Shimon testifies that Shumas and Mises were taken oh, out of this Tevel, and therefore it's cool and Minola. And how do you know he's believed? It's against the Cheskasis. And the same thing in the case of Hegdesh, where he says he knows that there was a process of annulment of She'ela. How do you know he's believed? It would be great if you could prove that he's believed, because then you'd see that Eretan is believed even against the Cheskas Isu. So that's called He, he Gufa Minol. Konomis Nami. Gemara says here's the third category. We're going to go through the same back and forth, the Shaka that we that we did with regard to both uh, Hegdesh and Evel. If he holds that whenever a person takes a nether and he points to a kikar or whatever object of every, and he says, Areze konom, this is a carbon, therefore yesh me'ilo, if now he would benefit from this kikar lechem, or whatever it is he prohibited, he would be in violation of the Isa Me'ilo. Uktushas Dabim Nachtalu. And then if you're holding Yesh Me'ilo Bekonomos, it means that anytime you take a nether with the language of Konom, you are in, you are uh, generating in that object a kedushas domin. Why? Because that's the maniyomu yesh milu konomus. Why did you compare it to a konom? You use that word in order to create the iser neder. It's because you wanted to give it a kind of quasi status of a karma. It has kedushas domin. Ah, if that be the case, you ask me, would the eid echad be believed? to say about a konon that it's mutter, he should be other lift also. He himself could be poder, kiddushas domin, that's Allah. So if we're going to hold yesh me with the konomos, then konomos come under hegdesh. And if it's hegdesh, then since it's his own hegdesh, then it's again the other lift also. And we're not operating here within the framework of Eidech and then Bisur. Because of Remi, Lubakonomos, that despite the fact that he used, he chose the language of Kodom and he said, Kikuzu Konom Alai, nevertheless, it's not Hegdesh and there's no Me'ila. Isur, Biyama, Hudu, Rochavle, Akatve. 
Rochel Katve is a, an idiomatic phrase that appears all over Shas. It means it's floating on it, so to speak. It's on his shoulders. So we're now assuming that we have a separate Easter nether that is independent of Hegdashos. No me'il. The Gemara says, "Idi day mishum dibiyon the lechuli alim." Even if I hold ain me'ilu bekonamos, but there's such a, an entity called hataris the darim, so I could be matu the neder. That's only again bidi day if he owns the kikar lechem. So the Eid Echad is testifying about someone else's konum. So it's again Shimon testifying about Ruvain's konum. The Omar, I know you're to Itchel Moriel. I know for a fact that there's no longer a status of, of a nether here because he, the, the Noder, which is Ruvain, was was Shoal on his neck. Now, I'm a little bit confused. What does it mean he's testifying that the, that the owner himself, well, what is the owner saying in this case? Uh, maybe it's a case where he died. And we can't question him. There's something here that I'm missing. Again, what does he say here? The Omar, I know you're dying to Itchel Mario. When we spoke about about Tevel, we used the word the Omar I know you Danabe to Misakin. Ah, but he's holding Sarathas Bailin. So it must have been done done with. So where are the Bailin here in these cases? I'll leave that for tomorrow, but I think the answer is that the Bailin are nowhere to be to be investigated, you know, to be interrogated. They're uh, out there. In any event, again. The pattern repeats itself for the third time. You want to assume that a person is neman about konomos to say that there was a she'ela, an annulment of that neder, of that konom. And you know he's believed. In other words, he, he himself could not be shoel on someone else's konon. So he doesn't have an emonis of yodom. The only emonis he has by process of elimination is eight ephod. So if that be the case, is he believed to say that indeed there was a she'ela on this nether? You're assuming yes, and therefore eight ephod is nemon even against a chezkas iser. But how do you know that that's the case? So all these three cases that we had of Tevel, Hegdesh, and Konomos will not establish the principle that Eid Echad is believed against the Cheskesis. Because in each case, we came to a brick wall at the end of the, at the, end of the road, and you know it, you know it. I don't know, you know, you're quoting cases, but I don't know the source for that. I don't know the, the, the source for relying on such a witness. And so too in our Mishnah, where did the Mishnah come off? Where, where was its source that Eidach could say that her husband died and he's believed? So this is where we're going to stop for today. We're going to pick it up. The, the next piece of Gemara, Amrav Zera, is probably 
the most important piece of Gemara in the entire parrot. And it's just two lines, but it really, in a sense, conveys the, 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 the whole secret message of this, of this chat. So Blinetta will, will pick that up tomorrow. Okay then, so wish everyone a great day.